Good, uh, good morning. Welcome everyone to class. Thank you for uh, joining class this morning. Um, we'll begin with a word of prayer. So I'll ask John Bessie to lead us in prayer, please. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you, God, in this morning, O oh God, as we are going to the class, O oh God, be with us, O oh God. We thank you for the everything, O oh Lord, what you have given us, O oh God. We thank you for this day, God. We thank you for this time, O oh God. As we are going to the class, O oh God, be with us, O oh God. Guide us, O oh Lord, Holy Spirit. You teach us, O oh God. You be with us, O oh God. I submit ourselves, our minds and hearts into your hands, O oh God. In Jesus' name I pray, Amen. 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 Thank you. Uh, so just before the other students make their presentation, I'll just go through a little uh, the content that was um, uh, shared and those who did not share, I'll just present those and then we can continue. So in 1880 to 1940, we see the forerunners of um, healing revival. There were many people uh, from the end of the 19th century into the early part of the 20th century. We are uh, on page number 51. And um, they began to minister healing very powerfully. They were true pioneers of the healing revival. And many of them had, um, you know, a powerful healing, uh, evangelistic um, and healing ministry. Okay. Um, some of them are uh, John Alexander Dowie. Uh, he was powerfully used by God in the healing ministry. Uh, he, uh, he became a forerunner in what would later be known as the healing revival. Uh, you know, he had witnessed many miraculous healing in response to prayer during uh, the plague outbreak. And he became convinced of divine healing um, or the role of uh, healing in the ministry okay and when he prayed for the sick with great faith um, you know many experienced uh, miraculous healings through his ministry uh, which spread widely especially in the united states you know um, however his uh, you know john alexander dowie's uh, journey was marked by challenges uh, you know, he believed that he was a modern day uh, Elijah who was sent to restore the church um, and which led to proclaim this role publicly. And, you know, it created a lot of controversies for him. <clears throat> Additionally, some of his uh, large scale projects, uh, including the founding of Zion City, which is a community for believers, uh, faced financial difficulties and a lot of criticisms. Okay. But in spite of all this, you know, his work paved the way for future healing ministries that left a legacy and emphasized the power of faith, prayer, and God's desire to heal. Okay. The other person is Maria Woodworth Eater. Uh, she's known for her intense spiritual encounters. Uh, Maria held revival meetings that was uh, marked by mass uh, healings. And people were experiencing deep spiritual trance, okay? Um, and she believed that God had empowered her uh, to basically demonstrate the Holy Spirit's power, okay? And her meetings drew large crowds because of the power of the Holy Spirit that was manifested. And she emphasized on the importance of personal relationship with Jesus Christ and she also paid a uh, uh, paved a significant role or played a significant role in paving the way for Pentecostal movement okay this lady was used by God for paving the way for Pentecostal movement and uh, she was very willing to travel uh, to different communities you know to spread the message of healing and the spiritual gifts across the United States okay uh, the other person is Smith Wigglesworth. He was known as the he's known as the Apostle of Faith, um, and uh, Smith Wigglesworth ministry was marked by bold faith, and was uh, also you know had a lot of dramatic healings, um, and you know may, uh, his his healing reports also included people that he raised from the uh, dead. Okay, he is actually a plumber. Uh, who is uh, illiterate, but his wife, like we heard, you know, taught him to read the Bible, and uh, th which became a sole source of his learning. Okay, and he became one of the most influential healing evangelists in the early twentieth uh, century. He was known for his unyielding faith, 
and for conducting healing services uh, where people would be miraculously healed of various ailments. I remember once um, he, I, I reading about Smith Wigglesworth, how he had gone to a, uh, a crusade, he spoke at the crusade, and when he ca came back, his wife was not there at home. And then, you know, um, uh, he he thought maybe she's gone to visit him. Uh, one of their friends was very sick, and when he went near that house, there was huge wailing and weeping and mourning. And so, you know, he, um, uh, he told his wife not to weep and moan loudly and he went into the room where the body was and he lay down and prayed his wife said he's already dead why do you want to worry you know why are you praying but he just prayed with such intense faith and that person was raised back to um, life okay so that is the faith and the power that smith wigglesworth had and um, he believed in if the faith in god's word was essential for healing okay so that was his basis Faith in God's word was essential for healing. And he often preached the power of faith and the importance of living a holy life. Okay. We also heard about Lillian, uh, who was a doctor by profession, but she was also a drug addict. And uh, she, she prayed and she was miraculously delivered from her, her drug ad addiction. And that uh, kind of built her faith. And she left her medical practice and she dedicated her life to teaching and writing about divine healing. Okay. Her work, especially her, her work, Healing from Heaven, uh, taught that physical healing was part of the atonement that Christ provided for us. So that was the book that she wrote. You know, and in that she mentions that the physical healing is part of the atoning sacrifice of the work of Jesus Christ that he provided for us on the cross. And she emphasized the uh, um, uh, importance of appropriating faith. That means we've already received healing on the cross. We need to just, you know, appropriate by faith and press in by faith. Okay. And um, also believed in actively receiving God's promises. God's promised that he's already healed us we just have to appropriate or receive that in our uh, lives. And her testimony inspired many uh, to turn to uh, in faith in prayer for healing. And when she often prayed for sick people, there was great results. Um, then we have, um, I think, John G. Lake and Fred, uh, other students are doing. So I leave that for time being. Uh, Amy um, Semple, Mike person, was an um, evangelist. Uh, who was known for her innovative views of media and drama in her services, you know, which attracted people from all walks of life. So she was very, I think, very good with art, so media and drama. Um, she was a founder of the Four Square Church and... Um, you know, uh, she built this uh, Agnes Temple in Los Angeles, which became a hub for both evangelism and social outreach. Uh, now, Amy um, services, Amy services featured powerful healing demonstration and also placed a strong emphasis on God's love and grace. So you see all of these healing evangelists, you know, they uh, focus on the cross. They focus on the finished work of the cross, God's word, uh, you know, the promises in God's word, and also receiving healing based on faith and declaring and speaking God's word and his uh, promises. But Amy's uh, focus or emphasis was basically on God's love and grace. Okay, God's love and his grace and her life um, and all that she wrote reached millions. And she inspired people to see God as actively involved in every aspect of their life, that God is somebody who can be included in every aspect of their life, including physical healing, and many experience um, healing in their lives, okay? Now, uh, when we move on to the 20th and the 21st century, uh, the revivals and the movements in the 20th to the 21st century, you know, from 1901, uh, 1901 till the present day, uh, we we'll, we'll look at a few of um, the revivalists and the movements that God brought about. Uh, we already looked at Charles Fox uh, Perham. Okay. Um, uh, Charles Fox Perham was a uh, very young evangelist and he was longing for an outpouring from heaven, which would make the church powerful, 
both in word and in deed. So he decided to travel around to you know, listen to the well-known uh, ministers of God and be part of their ministries and learn from them. So when he went around, you know, and uh, looked at various ministers and ministries and what they were doing, you know, uh, he evaluated what he saw. He became more convinced that he needed a mighty outpouring of the spirit. OK, so in October 1900, uh, together with his wife and sister in law, they opened Bethel Bible College in Kansas with about 40 students. And uh, the prayer was the central focus of this Bible college. Now, just three days before the New Year's Eve, uh, 1900, uh, Perham, you know, encouraged all of his students to study uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit, as it's given in the book of Acts, and to search for biblical evidence on how a person could know for certain whether they have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So. He encouraged them to read about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, read from the book of Acts, and also search scripture on what is the true evidence that a, to know that a person is baptized by the Holy um, Spirit. Okay. Now, the students, of course, did their research, and the students concluded, you know, um, that you know the it was speaking in tongues. Now, during the New Year's Eve watch night service, right? Just before, you know, the watch night service that we have New Year's Eve, late in the evening, uh, the Holy Spirit manifested himself in a very powerful way because here was a student body, you know, who was just praying and seeking God for the baptism of the Holy um, Spirit, okay? Now, about 11 p.m. that day, you know, um, as the, the break of the 20th century, uh, you know, Agnes, one of the students, um, you know, uh, she wanted to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Um, you know, so she, after the brief prayer, she experienced the power of God coming on her and she began to speak in Chinese language. She did not know Chinese. Remember the on the Pentecost, everyone spoke in different. It was not gibberish, the sun tongues, but it was tongues which other people could understand, but they did not know the language. So she started speaking in Chinese and she was not able to speak in English for three days, just Chinese. Okay. And this event stirred up, you know, the spiritual desire in Perham and the others, and they suspended all the normal activities in their Bible college and they just set aside time, uh, like, you know, like the early apostles did, uh, before, you know, the outpouring on the day of the Pentecost. So on January 3rd, uh, while they continued to pray, the student body experienced a mighty outpouring of the Spirit, many of them speaking in other tongues, and many people arrived from all over to this Bible college just to see um, and uh, receive the baptism of the Holy um, Spirit. Okay. Now this continued till 1901, the spring and fall of, uh, spring of 1901, uh, now, in the fall of 1901, uh, you know, uh, we see that Perham uh, sold the Bible college. He ended uh, his ministry there and he moved to, um, you know, travel across the country preaching the baptism of the Holy Spirit and divine uh, healing. Okay. And uh, in the winter of 1905, you know, he opened a Bible school in uh, Houston. And, um, you know, um, that's where William. Uh, Semor, you know, that God used as a great uh, uh, revivalist, yes, uh, you know, attended the school there and he was exposed to truth, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, later on, William uh, Semor was used mightily by God in the Azusa Street revival in Los Angeles. When I was reading this, I was so excited that, you know, we're teaching this to the Bible college students. What if the Bible college students just catch it on, get excited, pray? What a powerful revival that broke out. And because of one man who was, you know, hungry for an outpouring from heaven. So you see, when we are hungry and thirsty, the Bible says God would pour out. He'll feed, you know, he'll satisfy our hunger and he'll pour out rain on the parched soul. So that is what is required of us, just hungering and thirsting. And God will do the rest. Amazing, right? You're not excited? <laughs> okay. Um, 
Then the in 1707, we see the uh, or 1707, I don't like to say O, 1707, the Korean revival. Uh, the church in Korea had, you know, uh, several uh, seasons of revival in 1903, 1905, 1907, and in 1927 to 1929. And the fires of revival and prayer <clears throat> that were ignited in 1907 continues even today in the Korean church. Isn't that amazing? <coughs> Sorry. It's amazing when people go to Korea, they say they experience, you know, people wake up as early as 3.34. They travel all the way to the church or this prayer mountain that they have. And we see hundreds and thousands of people just praying. And then they pray for an hour or so. And from there, they leave and go back to their, uh, to their workplaces. Amazing. So it's even continuing today in Korea. Okay, so prayer is an important, and it started in 1907. Imagine it's still continuing today, and prayer has become an important and integral part of the Korean uh, church. And it's common to find thousands who gather regularly on Friday night prayer in their churches, or even spend days in prayer on the prayer mountain. They have something called a prayer um, mountain. Okay. Just amazing. I've heard many people who've gone to Korea who have seen this and, you know, they have just been so blessed. Okay. Um, can you please take the... I think this is generally in uh, Korea. Yeah, it just, it just says Korean Revival. Yeah, but we can make sure and let you know. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so um, uh, 1970, we look at the Asbury College revival. Now, Asbury College had revivals many times in 1905, in 1950, in 1958 and also 1970. And, uh, you know, it, there was recently a revival in, in 2023 as well in Asbury. Okay. So Asbury Bible College is one place where God is moving in a mighty way. And we recently had a revival that broke out, um, I think, on um, uh, Feb 8, 2023. Uh, okay. So, um, uh, Asbury College in Kentucky in the U.S., okay? So uh, we will not look at the uh, 1905, 1950, 1958 revival, but we look at the 1970 revival uh, during a regular chapel service. You know, um, uh, the dean, Custer Reynolds, was scheduled to speak in that uh, chapel in that morning. However, he just felt led to invite the students to give their personal testimonies, and many, uh, you know, gave, uh, you know, um, came forward and uh, just shared their testimonies. Uh, and many on that campus were also praying for revival, and they were expecting a revival. Now, when you pray for revival, another important thing is that you expect a revival, and that is what uh, happened in Asbury Theological College. Um, as soon as this dean gave um, an invitation, a large group of students were waiting in line uh, to speak. And, you know, there was a powerful move of uh, God that broke out on that chapel. There was such a great, awesome presence of God. People were just convinced, uh, con uh, confessing their sins. They were repenting. They were just sitting in silence before the Lord. Some of them praying, weeping, singing. Um, you know, uh, it was just so powerful. Right. And um, people did not want to leave. So this 1,500 seater uh, auditorium was packed. The classes were canceled for a week. But even after the classes resumed in on Feb 10th, you know, uh, the uh, auditorium was still open uh, for prayer and testimony. And the news of revival spread uh, in the newspaper and televisions across the United States. And, you know, people came from all over. Um, and um, 
and also the faculty and students from Asbury were invited, you know, uh, all around United States to share what was happening. And wherever they went and traveled and shared about the revival, revival followed. So just imagine what ha would happen if revival broke out in APC uh, Bible College. All of you are pursuing, desiring, hungering. There's a revival and people are calling you all over. You go back to your home places in the sun. Their revival breaks out. There's a mighty revival that's happening in India. Amen? Are you excited? <laughs> okay, the amen was very soft though. Okay. So, um, uh, in the summer of 1970, the revival had reached more than 130 other colleges and seminaries and Bible schools. And many churches, you know, um, also were influenced and it spread even to South America, not only to North America, but South America. Okay. And there was recently another revival that broke out on Feb 8, 2020. Uh, three which invited, uh, attracted many people from various backgrounds and locations and people were just living all around the campus, just staying in tents, uh, you know, uh, enjoying what God was doing and just in that move of uh, God, okay. Now, <clears throat> In eight, 1980, um, you know, to the current church growth, we look at that. Uh, from 18, 1980s, we begin to see outstanding church growth and several larger congregations being established globally. Uh, in almost every continent, we have churches with congregations numbering several thousands of them. And um, we'll just look at three largest congregations, okay? Uh, one was already mentioned to us um, last week, uh, the Korean revival, Paul Yonggi Cho. Um, and, um, you know, I think, uh, sorry, your name. Sugat, yes. Sugat shared about Paul Yonggi Cho uh, and the Yodo uh, Full Gospel Church in Su uh, Seoul, uh, Korea, which is one of the world's largest church. Um, now, um, uh, this church began like a very small tent in Seoul, uh, in a slum there in 1958. And then, you know, uh, it uh, went on to becoming a Yodo full gospel church in Korea. It was started by uh, the pastor Paul Yonggi Cho, and it has more than 1 million members. Okay, and Paul Yonggi Cho has a very nice testimony. He was, um, uh, when he was very young, he was Buddhist. He was uh, diagnosed with tuberculosis as a young person. He was dying. And there was one school student who every day on her way back from school home, God, I think the Holy Spirit led her to Paul Yonggi Cho and she would go and she would just you know, teach the gospel. And he would just listen to her because he says, anyway, I'm not going to accept this religion. I'm a Buddhist and I'm going to die soon. So no problem. I just listen to her. And she kept on going for a couple of days and weeks. And, you know, um, finally, she, she was seeing no change in uh, Paul Yongicho. And one day she really cried out, you know, she's saying, you must read this book. It's such a powerful book. If you read it, you will know it. So this Paul was wondering, why is she so, you know, so uh, uh, caught up with this book and this faith? What is there? You know, so she said, okay, leave that book. I will read it. And when he read it, you know, um, he read the Gospels. Uh, God touched him mightily. He was healed of his tuberculosis. He never got to see that student again, but he went on to, you know, becoming one of the greatest um, evangelist pastors who set up the world's last largest uh, church okay and they have so many cell groups satellite to cell uh, churches um, churches meeting all over so many one million members imagine okay and um, God told him that you know when he uh, started this church that his church will grow into a 5,000 member uh, ship and at one point of time all there were really few members in his church but one point of time even those few members were leaving and then when he was asking god god revealed to him that he cannot do it in his own strength but he has to depend on the work of the holy spirit that's when he had an encounter with the holy spirit and he's saying after that things just change so powerfully 
So when he was fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit, working alongside with the Holy Spirit, uh, he would tell Holy Spirit, you're the senior pastor, I'm the junior pastor, come on, let's go and serve the Lord today. He would talk like that to the Holy Spirit. And uh, that led to a powerful ministry, powerful church. Um, and, uh, you know, several factors that contributed to this uh, church was emphasis on prayer, the prayer mountain again that we talked about in Korea, you know, strong ministry of the word, healing miracles, uh, dependence on the Holy Spirit, and use of self-group and mass media, okay? So that was um, one of the largest churches that we see today, uh, which we're talking about the current church growth today. Uh, it's still present. Uh, recently, Paul Yonggi Cho uh, passed away. Uh, very sad, but a great man of God, okay? Another church that we see uh, that we're talking about, uh, we talked about three largest congregations that we're going to see. One is the uh, Paul Yongicho's church. The other one is a revival in Argentina. God used Coldio, uh, the pastor of Bonis Heiress Church uh, in, um, in, in um, uh, South America. Um, and, um, you know, this person, uh, God used mightily, uh, Claudio, you know, he began to sense a need to know the person of the Holy Spirit in his own life. And while he was seeking the Lord about this, the Holy Spirit touched him in a very powerful way and his ministry changed very dramatically. And an unusual presence of the Holy Spirit just accompanied, you know, his preaching, his teaching and his meetings uh, that resulted in, a, you know, a renewed hunger for God, uh, a new emphasis on personal holiness and a desire for prayer and demonstration of the Spirit's work. Okay, so um, uh, during his time, you know, uh, he, um, this man was saying that usually people in Argentina seek for methods, look for methods in how they can bring about church growth. But he said methods is not the answer. Yes, methods is important, but methods is not the uh, answer. What is the answer? We must pursue, we must seek the presence of God. So that is the that message is a simple message, and he emphasized on the presence of the Holy Spirit and uh, the revival that broke out in his church spread across, you know, Argentina. Okay, so powerful move of God. The other one is Rodney uh, Howard, but uh, the laughing revival, uh, we'll, uh, somebody else will be sharing on that. Okay, now we'll move to our presentations. Anyone has any questions before that? Any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, uh, we'll move to Angeline Mercy. Are you there? She was actually supposed to yes, present. Yes, yeah. yeah, can you, will you be presenting? Yes, Pastor. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Just one minute. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Let me just share my screen. Just give me a moment. Okay. Um, uh, today I'll be presenting uh, Hudson about uh, three missionaries. Uh, it's Hudson Taylor, John Nevius, and Jeremiah Lamphere. Uh, I'll start with Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor was born in England in 1832. Uh, he was he was a Protestant uh, British missionary who served in China for 51 years, and he founded the China Inland Mission. Um, just a little uh, background to his early life. Uh, he was he was born. Uh, his father was a Methodist preacher who had dedicated Hudson Taylor to go and share the gospel to China even be before he was born. Uh, Hudson Taylor never knew about this until uh, seven years after uh, going to Ch uh, China and starting his ministry. Um, but it was so beautiful to understand that his parents had dedicated him for the mission work and God uh, touched him so powerfully um, in his early life, in his youth. And uh, he also had the same passion to carry the gospel to China. Um, we see at the age of 15, he dedicated himself uh, to serving God and to uh, for God to use him uh, how he wanted to. Uh, he also 
um he he prepared himself even before going uh, to the mission field he prepared himself by studying medicine and theology um and at the age of 21 we see that he left uh, china uh, he sorry he left england to go uh, to china as a missionary and um he he had this belief that uh, uh, since he was from a different culture he had this belief that uh, when he went there he was able to uh, relate to the people and mingle more with the chinese people by adapting to their culture so uh, because of which he uh, he dressed himself as a chinese he shaved his head and uh, he had accepted among the chinese so these were some of the things that he did when he went there uh, and started his mission work we also see that uh, hudson taylor uh, there were uh, many uh, missionaries fellow missionaries at that time in china but he noticed that uh, they were they all wanted to settle in the coastal areas that is the outer parts of china uh, the most established parts of china so there were no there was there was nobody to go into the interiors of china where uh, the villages were there where there were so many people who did not know the gospel so he took it as his burden his passion to go into these interior parts of the villages of china and uh, he wanted to share the gospel there he he started uh, by distributing bibles and tracts and uh, teaching them the gospel two years uh, when he was in china two years later he fell very ill and he had to return to his hometown uh, to uh, to england he came back to england and uh, when he was recovering while he was recovering it was uh, then that god had put a, a burden for him to establish this uh, mission called as the uh, chinese uh, chinese inland uh, inland mission Uh, he had he had uh, he had come he had got introduced to uh, a a pastor friend who also ra uh, ran a magazine uh, through which he was able to uh, talk about uh, this mission talk about uh, the chinese struggles the, the gospel not uh, reached in china to all of the people um, in uh, in the western world in his in his country uh, and um, his his he spoke boldly he about this great mission that we all have go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature so that was his uh, his mission there i mean he uh, he uh, spoke about it he spoke about the struggles and he spoke about how uh, in his country there are so many missionaries for uh, every 2000 people but whereas in china so many millions of people are dying without even a single missionary to minister to them so he he laid about this passion this desire into the people's heart and uh, that's when this uh, this whole uh, china inland mission in uh, uh took place or uh, took birth and um, we see that um, uh he as i mean he formed his mission uh, this the mission of this establishment or this missionary establishment uh, organization was to take with them to uh, to uh, to uh, gather i mean to raise up missionaries and to take with them uh, missionaries to china who can go and spread the gospel so um within some time he was able to raise up 23 missionaries um and whom whom he had taken to china along with them and uh, they they went and they started uh, sharing the gospel even after going back with these missionaries after raising them up and taking them uh, to uh, china with uh, him he had to face a lot of struggles he faced struggles like um, uh, the new missionaries who went with them did not be, uh, did not live by what they believed uh, they had complained about their living conditions and uh, there were other struggles like he lost his 8 uh, year old daughter he uh, later on 3 years later he lost his uh, his son and then 3 uh, days later his wife so there were a lot of loss in his life there are a lot of struggles and challenges uh, when he was serving god in china but through it all he never complained he just prayed and trusted god um something that we can see from his life is uh, he he truly trusted god for everything uh, that god uh, had given him the passion to do so um Uh, even as the this uh, even as they continued with the struggles challenges they still went on to serve god in china and they uh, they 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 evangelized most of the most of the villages uh, it was one of the greatest uh, greatest times where so many people's lives were transformed through these uh, through the gospel work that was uh, that was shared that was taken to china uh, 
through this man of God and through all the missionaries that he had raised. And this missionary organization grew. Um, they grew by 1887. Uh, there were 102 missionaries who were with them, who uh, served God, who uh, shared the gospel, who spoke about Jesus, who took the love of Jesus into uh, into China. And um, there was a friend that uh, that he he had told a friend one day. No one. Uh, I mean. He had told him that if I had a thousand lives to give, every single uh, life would be given to China. China would claim every single one of them. So that was the passion that Hudson Taylor carried for China and uh, for the work of God. Uh, we, we see that um, um, we uh, the outcome of the revival or uh, through his life and ministry, we see that there was so many, the glory of God spread upon this community of Chinese, this Chinese community who had never seen or heard about uh, the true living God. So the glory of God spread in such a great way and uh, it brought them to the knowledge of the Lord. And uh, we see that many lives were touched and transformed like, like never before. There was an increasing harvest for the kingdom of God. People who did not know Jesus uh, Christ and the love of Christ were drawn into his kingdom. They were added into his kingdom. Uh, we see that thousands of people were raised as missionaries. They had they they chose to give up their the comforts of their homeland. They are uh, they are very uh, a comfort living and uh, they they wanted to go as missionaries to carry the gospel into the interiors of China. Uh, we see that many people were also equipped and sent out as ministers, uh, not only to China, even to other parts. Uh, new missions and uh, the, uh, new missions were started, established. There were a lot of churches that were planted uh, as a result of this spreading fire uh, through uh, throughout China. We see that uh, we say uh, we see that there were a lot of converts during his time um, uh, who came to the Lord Jesus Christ. There were about um, 800 over 800 uh, missionaries who were raised uh, during that time and uh, there were a lot of mission stations that were established over 300 and there were uh, a lot of local helpers the chinese uh, community local helpers over 500 people were raised uh, we see that um, the fruit of revival we learned in this course that the fruit of revi the revival remains it's not something that just happens at that time and just goes away or we forget about it. We see that the fruit uh, always remains. So in, in the case of Hudson Taylor, we see that this fruit, this fruit of this revival that started there of sharing the gospel, spreading the gospel into the interior parts, still continues today through the organization, uh, which is now uh, the uh, the China, China Inland Mission is now called as the Overseas Missionary Fellowship. Uh, it is an international and interdenominational evangelical Christian missionary society, which uh, raises up uh, missionaries and sends them to, uh, to different places uh, to evangelize uh, the people, to share and spread the gospel. So uh, that was the life of um, Hudson Taylor. I just want to lay, uh, leave a thought. Uh, he always, uh, when he uh, when he uh, spoke uh, to his uh, missionaries or when he um, when he uh, was uh, like teaching them, he always reminded uh, them one uh, three. Uh, there are three this this thing. I just wanted to leave this thought with us. Um, there were three approaches that uh, he said that there were three approaches we could take in doing God's work. Number one is we can make our plans and carry them out to the best of our ability. Uh, number two was uh, we can carefully lay our plans. We can determine uh, we can determine to carry them through with uh, with you know great success. And then we may ask God to prosper us in all that we are doing. Or uh, there is a third approach in doing God's work, which uh, he recommended was we can always begin with God. We can ask God uh, what are his plans. We can and then according to his plans, offer ourselves and then carry out his purposes. So today in whatever season, uh, this just reminded me that we are all in very different seasons of life. Some of us are just out of college. Some of us might be working. Some of us finished college, have come to Bible college. Uh, some of us are parents and uh, grandparents. We might be diff in different seasons of our life. In whatever season we are, uh, where are we? What approach are we taking to do God's work? Are we taking the first approach uh just planning and doing it 
second approach or are we taking the real important approach which is, which is the third approach are we asking god for our the plans that he has for us in this season of our life and then according to that are we preparing ourselves and are we going so that was the thought i just wanted to i learned and i wanted to just uh, leave behind uh, here uh, when talking about his life uh, second moving on to John Nevius, John Livingston Nevius was uh, an American Presbyterian ministry uh, uh, missionary again uh, who went to China. Uh, he was born in 1829 in New York. Um, he uh, when he when he was little, he was he had very uh, just a little background about him. When he was young, uh, he did not have much of spiritual uh, interest in spiritual things uh, until he was 20 years old. Um, we see that uh, he was a teacher in Georgia. That's when uh, God called him and uh, God put a burden into his heart to uh, to do his ministry. And he surrendered his life completely uh, to prepare himself. He attended the Princeton Theologic, uh, Theological Seminary for three years. And uh, during the during his course, during his stay there, he was influenced by a, lo a lot of missionary speakers who came there and who had spoken about their, li uh, their life and their missionary. So that inspired him a lot. Um, we see that he and his wife, Helen, they arrived in China in 1854. That was the next year after he finished his Bible college. And they spent, uh, he spent uh, his early days in China learning the Chinese culture and uh, the language. So he spent some time there to understand the culture, to uh, learn about the people and uh, know them so that they will, he will, they will be able to relate to them uh, in a better way to share the gospel. And uh, um, uh, this, this early investments of his time and energy uh, resulted in a lot of books, publications that he, uh, that he had written and published. He published about 15 books in Chinese to uh, his basic, uh, basic, uh, thing was that he, uh, he encouraged pastors and disciples. Um, that was his ma uh, main uh, motto or his vision. Um, and then they they um, they started off their early ministry. Uh, they used to visit. They used to visit uh, these uh, interior villages again and uh, go and preach. Go preach in the public places. And whoever was interested, they used to meet with them public uh, privately and they used to teach them about uh, Christ and more about the gospel. Um, and he was he he also did another thing apart from teaching in public uh, teaching the gospel sharing the gospel he also he also believed in uh, in uh, in a more systematic way of teaching the Bible to people, so that they can go and give fruit, they can yield their fruit. So that uh, he did, he did that through June through August each year. He 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 took about thirty to forty people uh, into his home where they had a systematic Bible study. So he was basically not only preaching, he was also teaching the Word of God. And uh, they, they later moved on to the province of Shandong uh, in North China, where they did most of their ministry work. They spent uh, time traveling, uh, traveling to different churches, visiting different churches and uh, teaching and disciplining people uh, in, in uh, like uh, disciplining people in uh, in the knowledge of Christ and in, in through through the word of God. He trained. He also trained many missionaries. Um, uh, he, he believed in one uh, one ideology or he believed in uh, in something uh, uh, which was establishing self-propagating self-governing and self-supporting churches so basically just to give a background of uh, why he believed this when he had arrived in china during that time there were like uh, there were other missionaries uh, there were other missionaries from other foreign uh, countries they had taken uh, they had um, they had uh, controlled the the churches in china when i say controlled i mean that uh, the money matters the financial matters um, uh, the the church pastors the evangelists the small churches everything was controlled by the the western world the uh, the, the people who sent that so uh, so it was like they were interfering with all of the things that were happening there so when he saw all of this uh, he brought about this uh, this this method this ideology or the ideas that is called as the nevius method of church planting it basically um it basically is um is 
just few ideas that he put across that would help the machine machine field um he uh, some of those ideas were that uh, um they uh, like i mentioned that the old ideology in china that was followed was uh, the missionaries were controlling the money the missionaries uh, or the missionary organizations were uh, they they were uh, they, every everything that was happening in the church the, the programs the meetings everything was controlled and uh, the decisions were made by them so the the local churches did not have any freedom to operate as they wished and to spend their money uh, according to what they had so uh, because of which he he came up with this uh, nevius church method uh, nevius method of church planting which was uh, basically few ideas which uh, enabled self propagating self supporting churches so uh, the churches in the, in this ideology he sp he spoke about or he spread the the knowledge of um the uh, basically he spread uh, or taught the biblical values uh, he 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 just brought about few ideologies where uh, the local churches should uh, be the ones that support uh, the pastor the pastoral leadership or the the local churches themselves should be able to um, raise money and uh, take care of the pastor pastoral uh, needs and the church needs uh, they were the ones who were supposed to decide on what meeting they can have and what kind of uh, um what kind of uh, things that they wanted to organize in their church and uh, they had a very um uh, they they had a very uh, uh, the they had an annual bible training which uh, which which enabled with made made sure that the new believers knew the doctrinal uh, uh, the doc doctrines that are there in the bible they uh, lived by that they adapted by that they could spread the gospel wherever they are be it in colleges in the place that they are they could they can bear fruit so these were some of the ideologies that uh, he spread and this uh, this nevius church uh, planting of church method um, also spread to uh, other other uh, places like in korea they heard about it they called him to come and speak and uh, uh, teach about it and um, even as he went there korea saw a great uh, significant growth and spread of the gospel even as they adapted these uh, self propagating self uh, supporting uh, methods of uh, the church ministry and mission fields uh, he did his ministry in china for uh, he continued his ministry for 40 years he kept basically he he uh, he kept training pastors encouraging people to pray and seek god and he led them in the biblical principles um so um what what we can learn from uh, the life of nevius livingston is um revival ushers us into becoming what god really intended the church to intended the church to be a habitation of god among man and a dwelling place of god's glory among men so uh, through his uh, teachings to through his ministry we see that um, um, we, uh, uh, he was shaping the church uh, to be what uh, really the god wanted the church to be he was molding them he he was preparing them and sending them he was not only uh, just uh, uh, they they saw a greater harvest even as they did this because people wherever they are uh, in schools in colleges wherever they are even as they were new believers they learned about christ they learned about gospel they learned about the truth they were able to uh, share it among the people who were in their surroundings in their neighborhoods in their workplaces and they were able to live that across so that pe when people saw lives were transformed so that was what uh, that uh, you can learn from the life of nevius uh, Ashaku, sorry to interrupt, Angeline. Good job. Uh, you just overshot your time. Uh, we just have uh, three more minutes before we go for a break. So you could, if you could quickly finish on the third one, please. Thank you. Oh, sure. Okay, sure. Uh, so, uh, the, sure, uh, Pastor. So, the last one that I would want to talk about today is the Layman's Prayer Revival. Uh, Layman's Prayer Revival is. Um, is a revival that is called the layman's prayer revival because uh, it was it was not uh, it was not by any um, great preacher well known preacher it was just uh, it, it i mean uh, it was just uh, led and uh, it it went through uh, by a layman who was named as uh, jeremiah lanfear uh, he was a businessman to that city and uh, we see that uh, god used this uh, this normal businessman to start about a prayer revival um, where uh, Initially, when they started the prayer revival, there were about five people uh, who joined him in prayer. And we see that over a period of time, God's presence started moving greatly, uh, mightily. And we see that um, there were there was a great uh, widespread revival throughout uh, 
throughout America, throughout New York City, and God used this uh, this this layman, this uh, this person, to uh, to bring about this greatest revival. This this is one of the greatest revival that is spoken of in American history, and a uh, lot of people, a lot of churches were uh, touched, and the presence of God moved so mightily that lives were transformed through this prayer revival. Uh, people were just seeking behind God. See, people were just seeking after God, and um, uh, um, where, where that was a time where the church attendance had come down greatly. But after this revival, we see that God's manifestation was so powerful, so mighty that uh, people started seeking God. When they felt that there was no need for them to uh, seek God, it was the other way after this revival that people started coming and uh, looking for God's presence. Even non-believers who did not know, they wanted to just come and see what was happening. And even as they came to these prayer meetings, they, they were just touched by God, God's presence. Uh, fell on them and their lives were transformed. They were confessing their sins. They were uh, they were uh, coming back and testifying what God was doing. So this was um, this was what was happening in that prayer revival and. Um, the important key of this revival was prayer. When we see God in prayer, God can do great things. So this this initial this prayer revival started because this group of businessmen just gathered together and prayed for one hour. They saw, they just wanted to seek God for one hour. So if uh, just to leave this thought that if if God can use a lame man to bring about such a great revival, what what can God do in our lives if we truly seek Him? Just give Him one hour um, and just truly seek Him. Ask Him what He wants to do in our lives. How much more can God do in our lives? Amen. Thank you, Angeline. Uh, good to see you uh, <laughs> after so many That's months. Good. Yes, nice, lovely to see you. Thank you. Uh, you're a gifted teacher. So God bless you. And uh, let's all put our hands together and clap for Angeline. Uh, Thanks thank so you. Much, that uh, means so much. Thank you. Yes, thank you. We'll go for our break now and we'll come back after the break and continue. <laughs> 